So the first thing I want to show you is Hans Rosling, who tragically died a couple of years ago. He's this health policy guy, statistician, and he had a book I showed you last week about how lots of things are getting better. And this is his tour of 200 countries over 200 years. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before, animating the data in real space, with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health, life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000 and 40,000. Down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today, and there, is the poor inland province Guaishou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. 
it involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> so a couple of things I want to point out about that. Do you remember when he showed life expectancy during the Spanish flu? And I went, <laughs> I learned during COVID the weird way that actuaries measure life expectancy. Because if you see standard tables of life expectancy in the United States, you'll see that line. And why? Well, because what they're doing is they're just assuming you get a Spanish flu every year. So when we heard that COVID reduced our life expectancy by, I think, what, it was one or two years? That was on the assumption that we would get. We got approximately 500,000 deaths a year, 450,000 deaths a year. That was on the assumption that we would get that every year. So it's not, it's a little weird. Similarly, I don't know if you noticed this, but you remember the big red one was China? Did you notice in the mid-60s in, in mid what it did? What was that? Yeah, bingo, bingo, Mao and his family. Okay, who here in the 1970s saw the Mary Tyler Moore show? All right, it's wonderful talking to people. You, it's amazing when you talk to like students who are 30 nowadays and you try to talk about Seinfeld and they say, who, you know. So remember Ted Baxter? Not the brightest bulb, right? So Ted Baxter once in one of the episodes said, he wanted to have six kids because one of them would solve the population problem. <laughs> Good, glad you're laughing, but now let me tell you why there's something to that. And this is the Julian Simon thing. Julian Simon was someone who believed in population control, believed the population uncontrolled would get out of bounds and we'd get you know, really bad effects. Higher population pushing on fixed resources. But he read some literature. He did what sometimes economists do, and actually, that is actually read and look at new data and look at new evidence. And he came across a book, and that got him reading lots of things, and he completely turned around. And his argument was, the ultimate resource, that's, that's the title of his book, the ultimate resource is people. The more people you have, yes, there are more people using resources, but there are also more people trying to come up with ways of economizing on resources, finding new resources, you know, finding ways of using fewer resources for a given output. And that really is a big part of the story of the 20th century. So there was a guy at Stanford, I think who's still at Stanford, named Paul Ehrlich, who wrote a book called The Population Bomb in 1970. And if you look at his predictions, man, are they off. Like, mass starvation by the year 2000, that kind of thing. Simon tried to engage him in discussion, and Ehrlich, you know, didn't want to talk. Uh, so Simon came up with an idea for a bet. He said to Ehrlich, do you agree that if there's growing population and fixed resources, prices or resources should go up? And Ehrlich says, yeah, I do agree. And he said, okay, well, I think there'll be new ways of expanding those resources and also economizing on them. So I don't think that'll happen. So you choose the five minerals, Paul, and we will price them in 1970 and price them again in 1980. And if they go up, I owe you the difference. And if they go down, you owe me the difference. And so 10 years pass, and guess what? Simon wins the bet. Now, I, when I was writing another article on it, I thought, I wonder if there's anywhere a copy of the check. And there is. Julian Simon, $576.07. Uh, notice who signed it. <laughs> so here's my little story I imagined. Honey, come on, you lost the bet. Send him the damn check. Well, I don't know. Well, I'm going to send it to him. So anyway, that's pretty good evidence on the population thing. By the way, population growth is slowing. There is this empirical reality, and we're still not totally sure why, that as people get wealthier, they want fewer kids. So notice what we saw, people getting wealthier. So I was asked back in 2015 to be one of the contributors to an economics journal 
to say, what's the world going to look like in 50 years? And instead of talking about like flying cars and stuff like that, I just thought, well, OK, let's look at what's happened to population, what happens to wealth. So I predicted that population would max out at, at 10 billion. It's now about 7.2. 7.3, and so we'll see. Well, I won't see, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Okay, now, I said also the review I did of Piketty, of his book, and I want to just look at what he says when he actually gets to admitting things. Nevertheless, according to official indices, the average per capita purchasing power in Britain and France in 1800 was about one-tenth of what it was in 2010. That's quite in line with stuff we looked at last week. In other words, with 20 to 30 times the average income in 1800, uh, someone in, in 1800 having 20 to 30 times the average of other people in 1800, a person would probably have lived no better than with two to three times the average income today. With five to 10 times the average income in 1800, one would have been in a situation somewhere between the minimum and average wage today. So that's just tremendous, tremendous progress. But then elsewhere, he blows it because he thinks in terms of shares rather than absolute. So here's the other thing he says. And the poorer half of the population are as poor today as they were in the past with barely 5% of total wealth, just as in 1910. No, if they have 5% of total wealth and wealth has grown tremendously, they're substantially better off. I want to say more about poverty. And one of the big issues is how to get out or stay out of poverty. And there's a very clear-cut solution. Work and, and do it legally, and do a legal job, and live with someone who works. And to back that up, I want to show you some data from the US Census uh, back in uh, 2015. It hasn't changed that much. There's a lot to explain in this table. You've got along the top row the various quintiles. The first quintile is the lowest income people. Second is next. Third is next. The fifth is the highest income people. And then none means no one in the household working. These are in millions. So each quintile has approximately 26 million households at the time. About 130 million households in the United States at the time. So in the first quintile, 15.6 million out of about 26 million have no one working. 8.5 million have one person working. 1 million have two people working. Virtually no one has three people working. Go all the way now to the top fifth. Only 900,000 out of 26 million have no one working in the top fifth. 5.5 million households have one person working. 13.7 million have two people working and so on. And then the top 5% is even more extreme. 100,000 100, have people have no one working, and 3.6 million households have uh, two people working. And look at the average on the bottom. The first has an average of four tenths of a person working. The top fifth has an average of two people working. Someone once said, there are three rules for making sure you're not poor in America. Finish high school, get a job, any job as long as it's legal, and live with someone who has a job. And do those things before you have kids. I think it's a horrible idea. Um, I, I've written a long article on it. If you're interested, I'll, I'll give it to Michelle and she can send it out. But let me just tell you, people say, well, that's so much better than all these welfare programs we have. But it's going to everyone. And his is 1,000 a month, so that's 12,000 a year. So I costed it out. And it increases the size of federal spending even if you got rid of every means-tested federal program, including Medicaid, it would increase the size of federal spending by about a trillion dollars annually. And then you have to tax, right? So it's a really bad idea.
I think it's completely solvable. Well, okay, so I think we have to divide the homeless into three groups. People who are mentally ill and, and drugs and stuff, and I'm not sure how to solve that. Second is people who are priced out of the housing market. Let, let's say two groups, people priced out of the housing market. And I know totally how to solve that, as does every economist who's ever looked at it. Allow more housing. We have among the tightest restrictions on building housing in the country. There's a labor economist at Harvard named Larry Katz, Lawrence Katz, who was the top undergrad economics major in 1980. And bless his heart, and I don't mean that in the Texas way, I mean bless his heart. <laughs> he gave the valedictorian thing at his graduation at Berkeley when he was an undergrad and said, I want to devote my whole talk to explaining to you why housing in California is getting so expensive. And this was in 1980. And it had gone up that much since 1970 versus the rest of the country. And he said it's because they won't allow people to build. One of the issues that comes up is in, in talking about growth, and I mentioned that more capital per labor, more productivity, but also more innovation, more productivity, higher wages. And then the question is, who gains from improvements in technology? So this is from a piece published in 2004 by William D. Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize in economics a few years ago. By the way, who here reads the Wall Street Journal regularly? Okay, the last 10 years or so, it's always been announced on Columbus Day, and then there's an article the next day in the Wall Street Journal on why that person won the Nobel Prize. And in 19 of the last 25 years, that article's been by me. <laughs> so I think I highlighted that, even though the Nobel Committee did not highlight that, which I think they should have. Only a minuscule fraction of the social returns from technological advances over the 1948-2001 period was captured by producers, indicating that most of the benefits of technological change are passed on to consumers rather than captured by producers. So, minuscule fraction. How minuscule? 2.2%. So 97.8% of the benefits from innovation go to consumers in two ways. One is the innovation itself, even while the innovator has a temporary monopoly, you've still got something that's better than what was or else you wouldn't be buying it. But second, competitors come along. And so the chainsaw I'm going to talk about in one of the later videos, there are other competitors coming along producing competing chainsaws and driving those prices down. And I found this when I was preparing a talk I gave in Maryland in March, I found this on, on Facebook just before my talk, and I couldn't resist it. This is a friend of mine, well, an acquaintance of mine I'm friendly with, better put, named Yaron Brook, who benefit more from the iPhone, a billionaire or me? I can talk to my kids from all over the world at a cost of nothing. I have every piece of music ever written in my pocket. Steve Jobs made this possible for me, and you tell me the billionaires exploit us? The benefits from this are widespread and huge. Again, think of that consumer surplus concept I talked about last time. Now, one of the things I said I would highlight was the major decline in poverty in America in the last few years, particularly among Hispanics and black households. And here it is. The green is Hispanic, uh, starts in 2009, goes to 2020, Green is Hispanic, black is orange, Asian is blue, and white is uh, non-Hispanic is black. Notice that starting around here, it really starts coming down for both black and Hispanic. Now, it is true that the biggest drop comes between 2019 and 2020. Right? But still, this was a substantial drop. So I wrote about this recently on my blog, and the Wall Street Journal picked it up as a notable and quotable, because this graph was in the 2022 economic report of the president put out by Joe Biden's Council of Economic Advisors. And here's what they said. 
Official estimates for the year 2021 will not be released until late 2022, but in 2020, the poverty rate fell to 9.6% from 11.8% in 2019, according to the supplemental poverty measure, which is a better measure than the usual for the reason they say. It accounts for the resources that many low-income households receive from the government. The declines in poverty were even larger for particular racial and ethnic groups, with the supplemental poverty rate among black and Hispanic Americans falling by 3.7 and 4.9 percentage points, respectively. That is what that graph shows. So that's 2019 to 2020. What does the economic report of the president leave out? It leaves out 2017 to 2019. Now, you might say, well, this is their way of taking credit and not giving credit to Donald Trump, but that doesn't make sense. Donald Trump was president from 2019 to 2020. They go on in the next paragraph, by the way, which I didn't bother putting up to kind of tell you, I think, why they did it this way. We had a massive increase in subsidies to children as part of the various expenditure bills, the CARES Act, and so on in 2020. So yeah, poverty fell among those households because of those massive subsidies. And they're calling for those subsidies to continue in the Build Back Better Act. And that's, I think, why they're focusing on it and leaving out 2017 to 2019, which then might get to Holly's point. Wouldn't someone who's curious want to know without any of those added subsidies why it fell without them from 2017 to 2019? And I think we've got an answer, by the way, which I've written about elsewhere. When the Tax Reform Act was passed at the end of 2017, Kevin Hassett, who was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under Donald Trump, predicted that family, household incomes would rise by an average of about 5,000 over about three years. And that's roughly what happened. Again, because of the tax law cut the corporate tax rate, it gave an incentive to invest in capital, more capital per labor, higher real wages. I think that's a big piece of what was going on. And even if I'm wrong about what was going on, I want the Council of Economic Advisors to be written by curious people, people who wonder what, what, why, and don't just shove it under the rug. Now, another way in which life has gotten better is pollution. And believe it or not, here I'm going to give a little credit to the US government. I want to show you some data. So remember I talked about how safety is a normal good? As we get wealthier, we value safety more, so we want more of it. Well, environmental quality is a normal good. People just barely trying to eat in 1900 were less concerned about the air they breathed. But as our standards of living increased, especially after World War II, we started wanting more environmental quality and we started getting it, a lot of it due to the Environmental Protection Act. Here are U.S. sulfur dioxide levels from 1970 to 2016. The solid green line is the mean. The 90th percentile is the dotted line, the 10th percentile dotted, and these, this is a range of values from monitoring sites across the U.S. But notice how each of them is going down. Less sulfur dioxide. Here's nitrogen dioxide, another pollutant, going down. Here's that major one, lead, going down when they took it out of the fuel. Is the fuel less effective? Yes. Is it saving people from breathing and having their brains not develop? Yes. So those are three ways that things have gotten better. By the way, though, I want to just point out who here has heard of Love Canal? Yeah. I think the story that came out about Love Canal biased a whole bunch of people in favor of government and against private enterprise who wouldn't have been biased if they knew the truth. So there was this guy who wrote it and did, did an investigative report in the 70s, and I quote from his article, 
This is my book, The Joy of Freedom, an Economist Odyssey. And I've got a chapter titled The Environment, Own It and Save It. That private property works really well in the environment if you can have private property. I want to read the first two paragraphs to you. In the early 1940s, a chemical company began to dump toxic chemicals into a site in a sparse, sparsely populated area of New York State. The company chose this site after careful investigation had shown that the soil was impermeable clay and that therefore the chemicals would not seep into the groundwater and harm people. The United States Army also dumped, dumped toxic waste in that site during and after World War II and the local government dumped refuse in the site. Then in 1952, the school board in the city where the toxic waste was buried threatened to use its eminent domain power to take the site from the company. The school board made clear that its goal was to build a school on the site. Rather than fight the action, the company gave in and offered to sell the land to the school board for one dollar. The school board accepted. The company wrote the following closing paragraph in the deed, and I'm not going to read you the whole paragraph, I'm going to read you one part, that basically it has waste products, and whatever you do, don't break through this impermeable clay site. Guess what they did? They broke through the impermeable clay site. So the Hooker Chemical Company was doing everything they could to persuade the school board not to mess with this, and they messed with it. And that came out in this investigative report, but most people still don't know it. One of the ideas that's come along in roughly the last five to 10 years, there's this new area of history called the new history of capitalism. And there have been a number of books published in this area. And the question is, was slavery a major source of 19th century economic growth? The people in the new history of capitalism say yes. Economic historians answer no. One of the major historians is a guy named Edward Baptist in his book, The Half Has Never Been Told. And here's what he says. Cotton production circa 1836 was valued at about 77 million and mill it made up about 5% of the entire gross domestic product of the United States. That's accurate. That's within the range of estimates that economists come up with. So it doesn't sound like, you know, I mean, cotton's produced by slaves. So it doesn't sound like that's a big deal. So now here's what Baptist does. He does what's one of the biggest mistakes you can make in economics. It's called double counting. And here's what two economic historians write in talking about Baptist numbers. But then by double counting and bad national product accounting, he boosts Cotton's role from, remember, 77 million to more than 600 million, almost half of the economic activity in the United States in 1836. Here's his method. He adds the value of inputs used to produce cotton, though this double counts costs already subsumed in the cotton's price. He adds the estimated value of land and slave sales, though asset sales are not counted as part of GDP. Further, he inexplicably adds the money spent by mill workers and Illinois hog farmers, and so on. And here's their comment about that methodology. If one extended this faulty methodology by summing the rules of cotton with a few other primary products, the amount would easily exceed 100% of GDP, which of course makes no sense. This article in which Olmsted and Rowe did this is in Explorations in Economic History. I was on a Zoom colloquium about a year ago when everything was on Zoom, and there's a famous economic historian at Stanford called Gavin Wright, and he said that when these two people wrote that article and submitted it to the same publication where one of the other articles appeared, by the way, a typical number of referees you get to referee an article, you know, it's a, it's a blind process, you don't, you don't know who you're refereeing, the person refereed doesn't know who's refereeing, so it's double blind. You get typically two, maybe you get three. The editor sent it out to four. Now, why do editors sometimes do that? They're typically looking for the negative. They want to find one person who doesn't think this should be published. It didn't work. All four said it should be published, and the editor decided not to publish it. 
This is in the Journal of Economic History, one of the major journals in economic history. So they put it in this lesser journal. Now, what about the whole idea of greed? How, how should we think about greed? And here, this is probably my favorite two minutes of Milton Friedman ever. When you see around the globe the maldistribution of wealth, the, the desperate plight of millions of people in underdeveloped countries, uh, when you see so few haves and so many have-nots, when you, when you see the greed and the concentration of power within, don't, aren't you ever, did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea to run on? Well, first of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow who's greedy. <laughs> this, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a, from a, a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by a free enterprise system. But it seems to reward not virtue as much as ability to manipulate the system. Uh, and what does reward virtue? You think the uh, communist commissar rewards virtue? You think a Hitler rewards virtue? You think, excuse me, if you'll pardon me, do you think American presidents reward virtue? Do they choose their appointees on the basis of the virtue of the people appointed or on the basis of their political clout? Is it really true that political self-interest is nobler somehow than economic self-interest? You know, I think you're taking a lot of things for granted. And just tell me where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us. Well, I don't even trust you to do that. I've put this on Facebook, and I have a lot of young economist friends in their 20s through late 30s, and, and young friends generally on Facebook. And to a person, if they comment, they comment, wasn't it nice that Phil Donahue let him talk? <laughs> like, you know, the amount of interruption that goes on nowadays. I mean, two people kind of respect each other, and, and it was kind of neat. The, so I like that so much better than that speech in Wall Street about greed is good. Right? I just think it's just such, so much more nuanced. He's talking about people's motivation. And in the Soviet Union, you had the nomenclatura. You had the top people in the Communist Party who were able to go into the shops that had foreign goods and Western goods and buy them at artificially low prices and so on. So the difference is here, if you want to call it greed, I don't like the word, but if you want to call it greed, if you have a free market, it harnesses greed. Think back to that 2.2% thing. People striving to make that a huge amount of money, and they do, but most of the gains go to consumers. The person who gets rich in America, unless he's using you know, cronyism or so on, which there is some of that, says, how can I help people? How can I help people? And I've got to figure out how to help people, and then I'm going to make money if I succeed in doing that. One of the issues I said I'd talk about is economic inequality within the United States. Here's a table I found in a publication some years ago, slightly dated because it goes to 2007 or 2010. But the point is it's going through that period where people are saying, oh, you know, the lower 20% aren't doing much better. So again, population quintiles, the poorest 20%. Now I should point out, so when you say the poorest 20%, that's not quite accurate because we're measuring income. When we talk about poverty, what really are we talking about? We're talking about wealth. So you could have low income and high wealth. It's very rare, but it could happen. 
Imagine someone living in Pebble Beach who has a $2 million house completely paid for and is living on Social Security. That person is low income and high wealth. Anyway, so this first thing gives the standard view that people have had. You look at the change in income from 79 to 2007 and look at market income and the poorest 20% had theirs fall by 33%. And then look at the top, it went up 32.7%. But now, look at household size adjusted post-tax, so after you've subtracted taxes, but also post-cash and in-kind transfers. Because a lot of people in the bottom 20% are getting food stamps, welfare, housing subsidies, and so on. And then it looks very different. Poorest, they improved by 31.8%. The rich is still more, 54%. So inequality is increasing, but it's a very different take than if you think the bottom fifth is doing worse. No, the bottom fifth is doing better. And then you also look at another one with realized capital gains, and the poorest are getting, it's 49%. Again, the richest, 71%. So by any of those measures, inequality is increasing, but everyone is doing better except in that first one. Now, don't forget income mobility. So here's from the census uh, 2015. Overall, 57.1% of households remained in the same income quintile between 2009 and 2012, while the remaining 42.9% of households experienced either an upward or downward movement across the income distribution. And, and here's a kind of a standard story. You graduate from high school, you don't go to college, you get a job, maybe fixing cars or something. You build skills. 10 years later, you are not, maybe you were in the bottom 20%. 10 years later, you're in the next higher 20% because you've got those skills and the higher income that goes with it. And so there's incredible mobility. So there's this award given in, in American uh, economics called the John Bates Clark Medal. And it's given to like the sharpest economist under 40. You know, Milton Friedman got it in the early 50s and Paul Samuelson got all these people. And it was every two years. So if you think of the universe of economists, where American economists then were probably 40% of all the world's economists and it's every two years, that's kind of like the Nobel Prize, right, in terms of numbers. So anyway, uh, Raj got it a few years ago, and he's big on looking at income distribution. So I want to show you this slide. Chance that a child born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution reaches the top fifth. USA, 7.5%. UK, 9%. Denmark, 11.7%. Canada, where I'm from, 13.5%. Notice that's the chance of reaching the top fifth. You're born to parents in the bottom fifth. That's a chance of reaching the top fifth. And his point is, you got a lower chance here than in other countries. And we can talk about one reason that might be in a minute. But now let me show you his next slide. And what I want you to do is, I, I cheated a little because I put something he says in bold, but I haven't changed a single word. I've just put it in bold. The central policy question, and this is his absolute next slide, and I watched the talk too, and it just goes along with these slides. Why are children's chances of escaping poverty so low in America? Question. Do you see anything wrong with saying that after what he showed in the previous slide? Yeah. Well, they're using the, the former uh, figures are inadequate to describe the situation. Bingo. As most of these graphs are. Bingo, go back to it. It's, this is the chance of reaching the top fifth. If you reach the second fifth, you're out of poverty. And by the way, the reality is, poverty rate is typically around 13%. So if you're in the, if you're in the top third of the bottom 20%, you're out of poverty. This was bait and switch. This was pure bait and switch. I wanna point out, and this is my video now, that there are two kinds of inequality. It seems every day a new report warns us of the dangers of rising inequality. We are told that a widening wealth gap 
will ultimately mean fewer economic opportunities and more corruption in our political system? The answer, according to many, is a dramatic increase in taxes on the rich. But before we make significant policy changes, we should ask whether the inequality we observe is good or bad. That might sound peculiar. After all, isn't all inequality bad? Let's consider two figures of 20th century American history. In the early 1940s, a Texas congressman defended the budget of the Federal Communications Commission. In return for his support, an FCC official suggested the politician have his wife apply for a license for a radio station in the underserved Austin market. She did so, and within a few weeks, magically, the FCC granted her permission to buy the license from the current owners. She then applied for permission to increase its time of operation from daylight hours only to 24 hours a day and at a much better part of the AM spectrum. And again, the FCC granted her permission within a few weeks. The commission also prevented competitors from entering the Austin market. That congressman was Lyndon B. Johnson. The FCC's special favors made him and his wife very rich. By the time he ran for president in 1964, the radio station accounted for over half of his and his wife's $14 million net worth. The second man is Robert McCullough. He became prominent in the late 1940s when he invented a light one-man chainsaw that made him quite rich. So rich, in fact, that he famously bought the London Bridge and had it shipped to Arizona. McCullough's success increased the gap in wealth between him and the non-wealthy, but his customers also benefited from a new tool that made their lives much easier. The moral difference between Robert McCullough's wealth and Lyndon Johnson's wealth couldn't be clearer. By using his government connections, Johnson became quite wealthy, but at the expense of consumers who were left with fewer options for radio stations. McCullough's wealth, by contrast, was a byproduct of an invention that benefited many. Of course, neither story is unique. There are still those who benefit by seeking special government favors at society's expense. But more important, there are thousands of entrepreneurs. Each one's success increases wealth inequality, but also improves the well-being of tens of millions of people. And as other competitors enter the market, they drive down prices and make consumers even better off. Indeed, Yale University economist and Nobel Prize winner William D. Nordhaus has estimated that only 2.2% of the gains from innovation are captured by the innovators. The rest goes to consumers. In short, there is indeed a distinction between good and bad inequality. Entrepreneurial innovation that improves the lives of consumers is good. Using political muscle to become wealthy is bad. Government policies that fail to distinguish between good and bad inequality will reduce innovation, weaken the economy, and ultimately give people more reason to seek special favors from the government. The last topic I want to get to, because like what I did when I thought about the second talk was think about things you might think of, but also things that you might wonder might get in the way of this great picture I'm painting, things like population, which I've talked about. Well, one that people talk about is global warming. So the question is, how much will global warming hurt the economy if we don't do anything about it? So there was a piece published in August 2019 by the National Bureau of Economic Research. And here's what they said. We study the long-term impact of climate change on economic activity across countries using a stochastic growth model where labor productivity is affected by country-specific climate variables defined as deviations of temperature and precipitation from their historical norms using a panel data set of 174 countries from 60 to 2014, we find that per capita real output growth 
is adversely affected by persistent changes in the temperature above or below its historic norm, but we do not obtain any statistically significant effects for changes in precipitation. And now here are the particular results. Our counterfactual analysis suggests a persistent increase in average global temperature by 0.04 degrees centigrade per year in the absence of mitigation policies reduces world real GDP per capita by 7.2 percent by 2100. On the other hand, abiding by the Paris Agreement, thereby limiting the temperature increase to 0.01 degrees centigrade per year annum, reduces the loss substantially to 1.07 percent. Okay? So now what I want to look at is what that means. I was at Pickleball this morning and someone did something about how we adjust this team or that team and someone said, I was told there'd be no math. Well, there's going to be a little math. Let's say there's no harm from global warming because they take these mitigation me measures. I'm, I'm thinking the 1% is so small, call that no harm. Now, assume a base rate of annual economic gro growth per capita equal 1% and x equals per capita income now. We're going to use that equation I gave you last week. Then, if we start in 2019 when this is written, we have 81 years to get to 2100. So we have x times 1.01 to the 81 power equals 2.24. What's that saying? Income per capita in 2100 would have been 224% of what it is now, which means 124% higher. Okay? That's if no harm from global warming. Now, what if there is harm from global warming because we don't do mitigation? So it falls by 7.22%. So it falls to 2.24 times 1 minus 7.22% equals 2.08. So per capita income is only 108% higher. So 108% higher versus 124% higher. In both cases, our, great, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren are substantially better off than we are. Now, what if we had an annual base rate of economic growth per capita equal to 2%? That's a pretty healthy growth rate. X times 1.02 to the 81 is 4.97. So income per capita in 2100 would have been 397% higher. It's 497% as much, so it's 397% higher than now. That's if there's no harm from global warming. If there's harm from global warming, then that number 4.97 falls by 7.22%. So it falls to 4.61. So Economic output is 461% of what it is now, and therefore it's only 361% higher. So 361% versus 397%. Substantial difference, yes, but notice that virtually everyone is better off. So that puts it in perspective. And there's one thing, I went through their article to see if they did this and they didn't. These, these authors, because they're kind of talking about, hey, this is a problem. It's 7.2%, 7.22% lower. So I thought, well, it costs something to mitigate. Do they put the cost of mitigation into their model? And the answer is no. And so this reduction, say, from 397% to 361% is an overstatement of the reduction because the 397% wouldn't have happened if you mitigated because you would have had to do something in that cost. But the other thing is, with income going up, as global warming happens and we get some of these bad things, we have more wealth to deal with them. I mean, you had in the Netherlands hundreds of years ago people building dikes against the sea. The technology has only got better. I have a friend who's, has, who, in Miami who has a friend in, in the local government there, and they're getting ready for it. He, he says they've got these amazing pumps, you know, to pump stuff out when the waves get a certain level and so on.
yeah, you got to start allowing desal and not have the, the uh, California Coastal Commission vote it down 11 to 0 the way they did with that one in Orange County a week or two ago. Yeah, you've got to deregulate. There's no way around that. Now, what I have said, remember, I'm from Canada, and if you look at the amount of fresh water that flows out of Canada into the ocean, if we took some number, we meaning the United States, not just the peninsula, if we took something like a third of that stuff that's otherwise running into the ocean, we would be set for probably about 100 years with pipelines and stuff. And I was telling a Canadian friend this, he said, you want to take our water? And I said, of course not. I want to buy your water, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just flowing into the ocean. And, 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 you know, but imagine the difficulties of building a pipeline. It often just comes down to regulation, and that's a problem. So this is off the top of my head, and I should check this, and, and maybe I will check this and, and get back to you. But the key thing economists want to know, there's one number they want to know to estimate that. And if I can find that number, I can give you a good answer. It's called the elasticity of demand for housing. If the elasticity of demand for housing is one, negative one, that means that if the quantity provided goes up 10%, the price falls by 10%. Quantity go, provided goes up by 20%, price falls by 20%. So if the quantity went up, say, 50% and the price fell, it, it gets a little unlinear. The fell, price fell by 30 or 40%. That would price a whole lot more people into the market. So that kind of question is, how many more people do you want priced into the market? What I would imagine is new cities being built, which we had in the last century. You know, Phoenix was nothing in 1910. Vegas was nothing in 1950. What I would also add is what economists tend to like to see is pricing of scarce resources. And one scarce resource is space on a freeway or a road. So we like to see pricing you know, with peak load pricing so that you can get, because the problem is, like a friend of mine moved from L.A. in the late 70s to Northern California, and he hated the traffic in L.A. in the late 70s. Now he says, I'm in Northern California, and it's as bad as it was in L.A. in the late 70s. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that when you go out on the road at 5 p.m., you're not paying any more than when you went on the road at 11 p.m. You know, in each case, you're paying zero. And this guy who won the Nobel Prize, he shared the Nobel Prize in economics named William Vickery, had written this piece back in the 50s in which he said, we could have cars that you know, go through these things and there's some electronic reader and, and you, you don't even have to slow down to get the cold toll taken and people are going, yeah, right. And guess what? That we've got that now. We've got it. I, I, was, I was in Florida. I was giving a talk. I wanted to go to Miami and I had a rental car and I'm going through these things where, hey, where do I stop and give them my money? And I'm, when, I go, when I drop it off with the enterprise, I go, am I going to get this big fine? And they go, no, you're just going to get a statement in the mail and you pay it with your credit card. And that's what happened. It was great. You know, I, so, yeah, there are solutions. Well, I think I would say... Imagine there were no Beethoven. What would your life be? Well, I've got to choose something you like. I love Beethoven. Well, me too. Okay. Well, it, it does contribute to the quality of life. Right. But does it contribute to economic growth? Well, but what is economic growth? It's us getting more and more things we like, right? And that's a part of economic growth. Economic growth isn't just multiplying the number of TVs or something like that. It's getting a better TV or better programming on TV. You know, there's that old line, 95% of everything is crap. And, and I think it's roughly right as far as entertainment. But now, look at what 95% is multiplied by. I mean, 
my wife and I are finding a new series on Netflix or BritBox or, or Paramount, that thing about making of The Godfather and stuff. Like, we're finding a new series every few weeks, and there was nothing like that 30 or 40 years ago. So I think it's a huge gain. Their income is a measure of GDP. It's part of GDP. So, And like when I think of, like when you said athletes, I think of Steph Curry. And just the pleasure I get from that guy, yeah. you know. Um, I, was, I was on a flight about eight years ago coming into Monterey, and I was talking to the guy beside me, and he was from Lansing. And we got talking about Draymond Green, who at the time I liked. <laughs> I think Draymond reminds me a little of Donald Trump. It's like, me, me, me. I don't care what I do to the team. I was cheated, you know, but anyway. Um, but I, that's when I liked him. And I said, you know, my wife and I think of the Warriors as being like our kids, you know, because we they could be. And like, we can imagine having them over for dinner. He said, yeah, like with Draymond. And he explained that when Draymond was at Michigan State, he had him over for dinner. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the, the point is like, I get tremendous value from watching the Warriors play and from watching what a person Steph Curry is, not just a player, but what a person he is, what a life coach he is for some of those players. And okay, so first of all, I want to address both parts of it, the dismal and the science. The dismal, it's an amazing story. Here's how I lead off the joy of freedom. For the last two centuries, economics has been called the dismal science. The person who coined the phrase was British anti-capitalist author Thomas Carlyle. You'll probably never guess why he called it that. I'd always thought it was because he was thinking of Thomas Robert Malthus, the economist who claimed incorrectly that population would grow exponentially while agricultural output would grow only arithmetically. Wrong. Economics is a dismal science, wrote Carlyle, because the free market economists of his time who dominated economics in the 19th century, strongly opposed slavery. Carlyle said economics was dismal because the economist opposed slavery. Stunning. OK, now to whether it's a science. Is it a science like physics, where you can kind of do lab experiments and hold things constant? No. By the way, there is a whole area of experimental economics where they try to do those things. But is a science in the sense there are certain things we're really sure of? Yes. So we're here. I'll tell you a couple of things we're sure of. The law of demand. When the price of something falls, all other things equal, the quantity of demand it increases. Another thing we're sure of, comparative advantage. When, when two people trade or there's trade between nations. Each country has an incentive to produce and specialize in the thing in which it has a comparative advantage. And then both sides gain from trade. Another thing we're sure of, price controls in a relatively competitive market that keep the price below what the price would have been create shortages and lineups. And unfortunately, might to get to test that again when, with that bill that the House just passed, the Democrats voted for that says we can't have prices of gasoline go above a certain amount. And I hope the Senate doesn't let it go through, because I think Biden would sign it. Um, but anyway, we're, we're sure of those kinds of things. We're sure that if there's a, an increase in quantity, all other things equal, the price will fall. So that, as I mentioned, housing. If, if suddenly the, the, they, they deregulated housing and let a lot more housing would be built, the price would fall. So there are a lot of things we're pretty sure of. Do we know what inflation will be next month? No, we don't. Do we know what unemployment will be like? No, we don't. Do we know that if the government gives a substantial unemployment benefit to people when they're unemployed and extends that benefit beyond the, next, beyond the typical 26 weeks, unemployment will either rise or not fall as much as it would have. Yes, we do know that. There's been a lot of evidence on that, new evidence on that in the last 10 or 12 years. Well, anyway, thank you very much. This is fine.